Good afternoon, everybody. How are you guys doing today? Good. Well, I'm really excited to be here. I, I can't tell you how much admiration I have for Matt and Jordan and John and Gene and everybody who works here. You guys are, are, are part of a, a really cool group, and we've been trying to, to kind of grow it and expand it, and uh, I can't say enough things about the sling. I'm an instructor. I have a sling over at John Wayne Airport, and I do flight instructing for private uh, pilots in that. And uh, I always like to tell people that Sling found me. I'm a writer for Plane and Pilot magazine, and I did an article about the airplane about four years ago. I took it with Matt to uh, Catalina, and I fell in love with the airplane. And I'm a tailwheel guy. I own a biplane, and I love airplanes that fly well. That's my thing. And uh, I fell in love with the airplane, and, and I made it a point to want to instruct in it. So it's, it's a great airplane. I can't say enough good things about it. So anyway. Um, again, my name is Mark Lee. I'm a flight instructor. That's what I do full time. I also teach aviation at Orange Coast College. I teach aerodynamics and meteorology and advanced aircraft systems uh, in ground school. I also am a writer for Flying Magazine and for Plane and Pilot Magazine, and uh, I'm always flying in some capacity or another. So aviation is what I love. I've loved it since I was a little kid. I've been flying since I was five years old when I first went up with my dad and was a student pilot, and so here I am. So. Today, we're going to talk about Catalina. And the first question that comes to mind probably is why am I talking about Catalina? I've been flying at Catalina since I was a kid. Um, Catalina fell, was, for whatever reason, hit a note in me, and I did a lot of research in the island. And I've made the crossing now in an airplane about 420 times. So I've been over there quite a few times. So let me ask you. So show, show of hands. You don't have to be a pilot. You don't have to be a, a you know, licensed pilot or whatever. When I say the word Catalina Airport, What's something that comes to mind? If I say Catalina Airport. Lucky. Lucky? <laughs> Airport <laughs> yes. in the sky. Airport in the sky, right. It's short. Short, okay. Downdraft. Downdraft, good man. <laughs> Too far from the <laughs> That's a great point. <laughs> chocolate chip <laughs> cookie. Yes, chocolate chip cookie. Go. What? <laughs> the kitty the loser. So it's all of those things are correct and there are a lot more adjectives we can use, right? This is a photograph from the the golden era of Catalina. There was a period, and we'll talk about it really briefly, from 1954 to about 1987, when flying boats ruled the skies and, and flew to Catalina. And it was an amazing, amazing time. Aviation figures heavily into the history of Catalina Island. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So let's, uh, let's get started here. And uh, let me ask you, why Catalina? So that's an actual photograph of Catalina. Why do we talk about Catalina so much? Why is it a big deal? Why are we talking about it as pilots? What is so, what is the mystique of Catalina Island? Buffalo burgers. Buffalo burgers, right. <laughs> well, for one, it's gorgeous. It's beautiful. I took that photograph just like three days ago. Um, it's a beautiful place. It's unique. There is no flat land on Catalina. It's a mountain range that sticks out of the water, out of the ocean. So it combines the best of desert, mountains, chaparral, ocean. If you go on the back side of Catalina, there's parts where if you close your eyes and you went to the back of the island, you would swear you're in the Caribbean. It's, it's an absolutely unique place. 26 miles from Los Angeles, right? 26 miles from the coast, but three worlds away. You go to Catalina and it's a different place. The pace is different, the, the, the feel is different, it's quiet, it's idyllic, it's a great place. And as pilots, we don't take enough advantage of it. So, Towards the end of this presentation, I'm going to give you a couple of little hints of things to do on Catalina that most people don't know. So we're going to talk about that. So it's beautiful for one. The sling looks great there. So there's that. There's that. There's Ooh, buffalo on the island, too. which most of you know that it, the island was put there because they filmed a lot of movies, especially westerns on the island. In 1924, they took a, a herd of, of uh, bison to the island to film a western, and they, the producers figured out that the cost of bringing them back was so much that they figured, you know what? Just let them go. <laughs> if they survive, they survive. And they have flourished. And today there are about 600 head of bison on Catalina Island. They're all tightly controlled and they're all regulated and uh, they're looked at by veterinarians and they're very well, very well taken care of. The only, the only island where you can have where there are bison. That's you. A great little airport cafe. Most of us go there because you can sit outside in the summer or the spring and it's just beautiful. You can watch the buffalo grazing on certain days. There's wild foxes that come up uh, and, and, you know, run around the tables. Jordan, you were there this morning, so how was it? Beautiful, Beautiful right? Um, did you know? So here's a little did you know. Let me borrow this here. Um, it was the filming location for over 400 films and TV shows. It's the reason Catalina was originally put on the map. 
Uh, a lot of silent films were filmed there, including uh, Mutiny on the Bounty with Clark Gable. So this is a big one. In May 1912, almost today, almost to the day today, in 1912, Glenn Martin took off from what is now John Wayne Airport, near what is now John Wayne Airport, from Balboa to Catalina in a little, basically, a box site with a motor and a, a balsa wood single pontoon underneath. And he flew into a 2,500 foot overcast because, of course, it was May. <laughs> and so, you know, the marine layer. And he flew from Balboa to Catalina, the longest ever overwater flight in history and the first sea land in history. And that was in 1912, nine years after Wilbur and Orville did their thing in, uh, at Kitty Hawk. So it, it started from the very beginning. That little event, believe it or not, was such a huge thing that it, it, the news traveled around the world. And so it was put on the map. When that happened, Hollywood began calling. And they started doing uh, movies there, and I'll tell you about that in a second. It was the spring training location of the Chicago Cubs for nearly 40 years. Most people don't know that. Uh, from it came famous Catalina tiles. I don't know if any of you are designers or home people, but Catalina tiles are highly sought after tiles that were made from the red dirt, which is unique to Catalina Island. And that was the Catalina tiles. It was the home of Western author Zane Gray, amongst other people. Um, yes. Secret Naval Special Forces trained there during World War II. And they had a, to this day, there's a, uh, there's, there's a lot of misinformation about what happened there. The water around it is known as the Great White Shark Habitat. And it has some of the deepest waters in the Western Pacific all around it. So it's, uh, there have been a number of crashes, um, and the, the airplanes go down and they're never brought up again because it's so deep and it's so steep. The slope is very steep. So today we're just going to talk about a couple of really quick things. We're not going to make this long, I promise. I won't bore you. We're going to go quick, and then uh, at the end I'm going to give you some travel hints. But what makes Catalina Airport so unique and so important? Uh, is it dangerous? Who, who here thinks Catalina is dangerous? Nobody's willing to admit it. Catalina, a lot of people, yeah, a lot of people, will, have you ever told pilots that you, that you fly to Catalina? They'll be talking and they'll say, oh, whoa, <laughs> whoa, Catalina, you fly to Catalina? Wow, I've heard, you know. There are sea monsters. On the runway. And you say, yes, there are. How can we maximize safety when landing there? What's there to do for pilots besides the $100 bison burger? And some tips and techniques. OK, look back. Catalina seaplanes, the, the era of the Grummets. We're going to take a one minute look at the history of, of Catalina. So 1912, Glenn Martin puts it on the map with his little box kite airplane. He leaves from Balboa, goes into an overcast with a, a compass strapped to his right leg and a barometer strapped to his left leg. <laughs> that was it. He had never flown into overcast. He flies into the overcast and based on the time, not on anything else, but based on the time and the compass, the, the, the compass heading that he had and what he estimated the winds to be, he let through the overcast when he thought the island was there. And he was actually only about a quarter mile away from Alba. Mm -hmm. so pretty, he was an amazing aviator. Um, in 1919, William Wrigley buys the island. He's the guy, the chewing gum fortune. Wrigley, he also bought the Chicago Cubs. Um, <clears throat> he was a developer, and he saw a lot of potential in Catalina. And so he bought the island completely from the Banning brothers. You know, guys know Banning Airport? The Banning brothers actually were the ones that owned Catalina before that. In 1920s, Hollywood discovers Catalina. Here's a picture of Mutiny on the Bounty um, being filmed. And what happened is the stars would go there, film the movies, and then on their time off, they would return, mostly because they weren't bothered there. They could bring their boats and they could, you know, spend their, their weekend in the bay. There were no paparazzi, there were no, you know, fans, and yet it was only a few miles from Los Angeles. So really Hollywood kind of started the whole thing. Then as tourists figured out that there were movie stars there, they started coming, and boom, Avalon started to boom because they put in bed and breakfast and hotels and restaurants, and that's really what started the whole thing. And then in the 1920s, the first seaplanes started arriving there because they figured the people with money didn't want to take six hours to cross the channel in a steamship. That was the only option. So instead, they went across in a, on a seaplane, and it took about 25 minutes. So if you had money, you would do this. This is Charlie Chaplin's brother. He started an airline called Chaplin Airlines. In the 1930s, they built the first turntable airport. This is in Hamilton Cove. So Avalon, this, if we're looking towards the mainland, Avalon would be just around the left of this cove here. So this is a turntable right here and, and a concrete ramp that they built into the water. A seaplane would come up, unload passengers, and they would just turn it around on this, this turntable and then send it back out again. So they, so they didn't have to have a lot of room to, to uh, turn the airplanes around. And it was a, a flourishing, uh, flourishing operation. This building that you see here, this is Catalina Airport, this is the same hangar that's there now. 
They actually took it apart and wood like plank by plank and moved it up to the airport in 1940. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. In 1940, the construction begins on the airport. There's no flat land, so the surveyor said there's no way to put an airport here. So Philip Wrigley, who's William's son, was an aviation enthusiast. He said, well, why don't we blow up two mountains and take the dirt from the mountains and fill in the hole and put a runway on top of it? So that's what they did, 200,000 truckloads of dirt. And they blew up two mountains to do it. That's what the terminal looked like before. This was the passenger terminal. That's the fireplace that's still there. So if you guys think about it, this is out that way. This way would be the patio, for those of you that are been, have been there. That's the entrance. And so the souvenir shop and all that would be over here where I'm standing. But that's, it was a pretty opulent terminal in those days. It was built in the Spanish style. And then uh, United Airlines started service there in 1946. And they would take DC-3s. This is actually taken at, at Catalina. And <coughs> the Avalon Doves, a funky airplane. Both of those airplanes took passengers to Avalon for a long time. The problem is that nobody likes to drive to Avalon. Let me see if I can show you why. So here's a little video. Of, this, is a, this is the bus ride. This didn't sit well with a lot of passengers. And they figured out that it took 25 minutes to get to the island, and then 35 minutes to get to Avalon in this bus on these little windy roads on the cliffs. So the people just didn't want to do it, and the passenger traffic was just not there. So they couldn't really make a profit. So finally, uh, they gave up. In 1954, United stopped all fixed wing service, as did all the other airlines. 1954 to 87 was the golden era of the seaplanes, and that's when all the seaplanes would go directly to Avalon Harbor. And they flew something like 14 million passengers in 30 years. And it was a huge operation. It was a, a, a very successful operation, as you can see. As there were always planes in the sky at Catalina. Those of you who might have a few gray hairs like I do probably remember these guys uh, flying out of here at uh, San Pedro. Yep. Many trips. Yeah, many trips. You see them all the time. And it was, a, it was a regular thing. They used Grumman Goose, Grumman Albatross, Grumman Mallards. And uh, it was kind of the workhorse of the Catalina airline. That's just another... Another photo. It was, a, it was a great time. It was kind of the classic era of Catalina. In 1959, the airport that Philip Wrigley built, that started in 1940, he opens it to the public because he would get constant calls from his buddies saying, hey, can we land on your airport? It was a private airport. It still is today. And so he opened it up to the public in 1959. Fifty airplanes from Torrance, Orange County, and Long Beach flew there to, <laughs> uh, to commemorate the, uh, the opening. I'm sure they, got all, they were all hungry because there, no, uh, there was no restaurant in those days. 